ಓಂ ನಿರಂಜನ ನಿತ್ಯಮನಂತರೂಪಂ ಭಕ್ತಾನುಕಂಪಾಧೃತ ವಿಗ್ರಹಂ ವೈ ಈಶಾವತಾರಂ ಪರಮೇಶಮಿಡ್ಯಂ ತಮ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಶಿರ್ಷಾ ನಮಃ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತಾ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಥರ್ಟೀನ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ರಿವೈಸಿಂಗ್ ದಿ ಫರ್ಸಸ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ವ್ಯೂ ಆಫ್ uh the application and chapter 13 the first stage section there is this teachings which shri krishna calls as jnana they are basically disciplines to be followed the purpose is for the purification of the mind chitta shuddhi and we discussed at great length what happens whenever we engage in any thought word and deed it creates what is called chitta vrittis thought waves or whirlpools within the mind space and those my those whirlpools with this leave what is called their impressions samskaras and the sum total of the samskaras is is what defines the general bent of our mind which way it's going whether it's a worldly mind or a spiritual mind or somewhere in between having understood that uh and i'm saying that if it's pravritti outwards then the mind goes down 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 and becomes full of all this worldly samskaras and when it is engaged to the divine spiritual thoughts ideas through japa meditation satsang tirtha any of those things it creates spiritual samskaras and we as spiritual aspirants having understood that would be very alert about consciously generating creating those samskaras through our everyday activity so that being the idea uh all those disciplines that were discussed as jnana are to be practiced wherever the opportunity comes but that alertness is there and vigilance watching your own mind what are you thinking about as you think so we become the power of the mind is is so great that in the gita it is said whatever is the last thought at the time we leave this world determines our next birth and such, such is the power of the mind and so if we through practice have developed that capacity it's called abhyasa yoga the yoga of practice uh, a mind that is naturally now directed towards the contemplation of the divine repeating the mantra or thinking of some holy thought and we can make that happen at the moment at the time we depart to, from this body then we have secured a upward direction uh, evolution spiritual evolution and that being the idea uh, we practice sadhana because you never know what would be the condition when you are old sick you're tired your mind is not really under your control we see all those things when people are hospitalized and imagine living a world where you don't have any control of your mind so unless this uh, sadhana are done uh, regularly with great intensity the momentum would not be there at the time of departure now in the second section we are looking at the aspect of the divine the reality behind it what is called the gyan uh, gya what is to be known what is to be realized and in that we are talking about the imminent aspect of the reality so in the scriptures there are two categories one is the transcendental reality that is the pure brahman nameless formless uh absolute beyond the reach of the mind and beyond the mind of speech you can't even think about it you can meditate on some own conception of it like it's light or infinite space but again the mind comes in puts its own understanding on top of that but the same reality which is transcendental is also imminent imminent means it is present in everything and actually that what we call everything is that same power of the divine when it is engaged in the process of srishti sthiti samhara is called shakti the divine mother we approach that the uh, divine in that way because mother is very gracious and we hope to win her goodwill that's why we worship the divine mother as durga kali lakshmi saraswati and and present in all forms 
human forms. Women are all embodiments of the Divine Mother. And that's how one should have that type of spiritualized relationship with, with uh, these manifested mothers, our own mother and in everyone. She is present in all this form. Now, in this second section, we are talking about that imminent aspect. How do we recognize after we have studied this and developed some concepts, some ideas in our head, and we go out into the world and we engage with everyone, how do we try to keep a part of the mind on the reality that has assumed these names and forms, the people in front of us, all around us, and be aware that right in front of me, within me and outside me, that same power is active. That was the subject matter of Kashmir Shaivism's text, Pratyabhikna Hridayam, which we have just completed our studies on. But that's the same truth here also. So the presence of that divine in everything is what we want to become aware of. And verses 13, 14, I think, 12 onwards, is about that. We started that, uh, the discussions, and uh, let's quickly revise through this uh, verse or not. So Sri Krishna says, I shall now speak. So he talks about the next subject matter. Uh, what is to be known? That is a supreme reality. And why one should realize it? Well, there's a result. When the result is known, then this gives some impetus, uh, um, motivation to work to that. And what is that? by realizing which one attains immortality. Now that's a wonderful thing. One can reach a state of existence or awareness uh, where one is never born, one does not die beyond all the cycle of coming and going and in that ab absolutely blissful state. When you think about that state again and again and again, at some point the mind says, I want that. Why? Because it is my our own true nature. And so that supreme begin Brahman is without any beginning, without any end. And it is neither being nor non-being because being and non-being means that is you're coming into manifestation. So it's beyond manifestation, beyond also. And then from 13 onwards, how do we recognize that power? Where is it? You might say, where is God? I can't see him, you know? So there's no God. No, he's present everywhere. Everything that happens, happens because of the presence of that consciousness inside us. And the consciousness departs, everything falls apart. So, oh, there's a little bit of poetic there. Okay. And so, how do we become aware of that presence? Because if you don't do that, then you appropriate all that activity of the senses and the body to that ego. And the ego says, I am the doer, I am the enjoyer. But if you recognize that behind the ego is that power, supreme consciousness behind the wave is the ocean. Uh, and everything originates, the energy activity originates from there. Then the wave says, based on that knowledge, I'm only an instrument. And the wave is the, the doer. God is the doer. And that state when one is what you call established in realization, that is called Jivan Mukta. Sri Ramakrishna defines Jivan Mukti he said, if you have realized uh, God, that supreme consciousness, when you come down again, that is called Vijnana. Jnana is your identification with Brahman. Vijnana, you come down and you see everything is pervaded by that same consciousness, wearing all these names and forms, people, plant, animals, gods, goddesses, everything. But you are aware of the contained, not so much the container. Everything becomes like a, the human appears like a little bit of a uh, covering. That's all. But the awareness of the consciousness is more powerful than the covering. And so then that state, uh, in that state we see the divine is playing in all these forms, the good, the bad, the ugly, everywhere it is. And because you see that one, then we don't react to all the drama that happens in life, whether it is good or bad or ugly or whatever is happening, you're aware that it's a play of the divine. The divine has got its own there's no reason for a play, he enjoys, and we are his playmates. So, in this particular verse 13, we discuss Sarvata Pani Padam Tat, Sarvato Akshi Shiro Mukham, Sarvata Shrutimal Loke Sarvam Avritya Tishtati. This 
here is talking about the jnana indriyas and karma indriyas. We are doing so many things through our hands and feet. We speak. So these are the three uh, of the five organs of action. And then we have got these five organs of knowledge. Eyes, ears, nose, skin, tongue. And so behind all that sensation, behind all that movement that is there, all that happens is because that consciousness is present. And when that consciousness disconnects, then everything, Ram Nam Sat Hai, as they say, Chala Gaya. So, so while we're seeing all these activities or doing all activities, let us try to keep a, a, a part of our attention on the reality that is constantly working through us, individually, in, in, internally, and working through others also. It's a very powerful application. If you can apply it, you'll see uh, if you take that out and say everyone is an individual, good and bad, then we become judgmental. We have very strong reactions and reactions to things. But if the moment we bring this one divinity behind everything, then you see immediately a lot of issues get resolved. The problems are not solved in a spiritual way. We don't solve problems. We resolve the problems to the cause. So the manifold that we see, that is a problematic area. When we resolve them to the ocean, to the cause behind it and say, God is there in all these forms in front of me, with me, husband, wife, children, mother, father, in-laws, outlaws, whatever you want to say, people, society, community, boss, that is appear he's appearing in all these forms. And let me be mindful and be watch, uh, see how much I can keep my mind on that. Immediately, the whole drama changes. That which was a terrible play, uh, what do you call, uh, suffering now becomes a drama. Actually, intellectually, even if we realize or think about it, immediately the world loses so much of its grip on us. But imagine what would be the situation when one has that real realization one sees through the spiritual eye. As Sri Krishna uh, blessed Arjuna to have a glimpse of it in, the, uh, in chapter 11. Vishwarup Darshan Yoga. Okay, so last time somebody asked this question, what does it mean that is pervading everything? It's pervading mean, so always work from the top down, it's easier. And last time I gave the example, imagine there's an infinite ocean of consciousness in all direction, visualize it to be a light in front, behind, right, left, above, below, there's not a single ripple, there's no differentiation, just perfectly homogeneous. And then in that ocean of consciousness, which is Brahman, by its own sweet will, but it's a living conscious, totally aware of itself. It's not just like light, sunlight or whatever. Like It's a living consciousness, more conscious than we are. And so in that consciousness, by its sweet will, it begins to create something, this whole universe, living beings. What has happened? First, imagine in that light, uh, a bubble appears, like a soap bubble that marks a boundary. Something is outside now, something is inside. That which is inside is the starting of that individuality. The eye sense appears there. But at that time, in that bubble, it's full of bliss. You still feel very, very joyful and good. But then the next level of differentiation happens. Differentiation means prakriti. Something becomes degraded, reduced. And so here the energy level goes down and then it becomes what is called the antakarna, the mind, buddhi. Chitta, man, buddhi, ahankara. Manas, buddhi, intelligence, ahankara is that I sense. And it is like the water vapor that was inside the bubble has now become condensed as water. That's a good example. And then it has solidified, less energy is there. And then it goes to the next stage, the third stage, where it freezes and becomes a block of a sphere of ice in there. Same substance. Water molecules in three different energy states, ice, water, water vapor. But the energy has become less and less and less. So while this differentiation was happening, that ocean of consciousness is still pervading through all of them. It's not that the ocean is outside and inside is the bubble. No, the whole space is there. Uh, so if we have a balloon and say, Think in that way, you blow some air into the blown inflates, there's some air inside, there's air outside. But the space inside the balloon, so air becomes divided. When the balloon shifts, the air moves along with it. 
but does the, the space that is occupied by the spherical balloon, does that move when the balloon moves? The answer is no, that is stationary. In it, everything moves, but the space itself is constant. We might talk about, uh, this is my house, room space, office space, by putting some boundaries around it. But those boundaries neither differentiate or divide it. It's in our own way of understanding it. You break the, the balloon bust, nothing happened to the space. The space did not say I was contracted and now I have become released like that. The air will say that I was caught into it and I'm released out of it. That's why the jiva says I'm bound and I'm, I'm, I'm released. But Brahman, which is the consciousness, says I'm nitya mukta. I'm, I was never caught in that balloon or wave whatever I want to say, whichever analogy. So that is called all-pervading. Sarvam avritya tishthati. It abides by pervading all things equally. That's the idea. Uh, I thought I would just rewind. And now in the 14th verse, it talks about shining through the functions of the organs. So how do we know it is pervading there? Well, as the organs function, from there we infer by inference that the consciousness is there. Okay, when the, the organs, uh, sense organs are functioning or organs of affection are functioning, then we know there is some consciousness is there. That gives us some idea about life. We have never seen the jiva inside us. It's too subtle to be seen, but its presence is inferred by the activities of the body. So if somebody is sleeping and somebody checks out, is it alive or not? Then you go and call that person out. Hey, who are you? Wake up. If they response, and then he says he's awake. But if he's not responding, not responding at all, then as a science, is, we are not able to infer, or we're beginning to infer he's not there. Then we check a few other things, check the heartbeat, check the breath, check the temperature. And by that time, the doctor says, these are the signs, the vital signs are not showing. Therefore, life has departed. So, really, as the Brahman, the consciousness, did it leave? No, it's all pervading all the time. It just has become disconnected. The energy that was flowing from that higher level is not able to continue and supply uh, the physical body. And therefore, the physical body loses its supply of energy. And we say it's beginning to disintegrate uh, and decay and all those type of things. Get rid of it. Burn it, cremate it, or, uh, or uh, you know, bury it. So... So, shining through the functions of all the organs, yet devoid of all the organs. You see, the, if the organs are not there, it doesn't mean that it is not there anymore. It is the subtle power that is flowing through. Uh, it's like your electricity flowing through your um, uh, circuit. Suppose uh, uh, the bulb fuses, no more light. But that doesn't mean there's no electricity in the wire. It's a, the gross means by which we that, that consciousness or light was being manifested, that has become defective, but the subtle power is still there. So that Atman is ever present. It can operate and activate the various organs, but it can exist without the organs also. So it is unattached. Okay, the body exists or not exit, it doesn't make any difference to it. But it is the supporter of all that. Without it, the body doesn't exist because the gross depends on the subtle. The subtle depends on the kaushal. Kaushal depends on the supreme consciousness. Eyes depends on water, water and water vapor and ultimately whatever is that energy. So it is without the gunas and yet the perceiver of the gunas, the operator of the gunas. Gunas means sattva rajasthamas. Out of these three uh, gunas, everything in this universe right from uh, this is what prakriti is right from the ego down are different manifestations of the three gunas. These gunas operate, activities in the body-mind complex happen because of the presence of that consciousness. So that's the idea. What do we learn from this? We learn to recognize the presence of that consciousness inside us, uh, which is making all this activity happy happen, good, bad, whatever is happen happening. And therefore, rightfully, all agency or the result of activities, success and failures, whatever, should be given to the rightful doer. And therefore, a devotee, 
recognizing that says i'm only an instrument you are the doer whatever happens in this body happens by your will this work the results of it is offered it to you sri krishna arpanamastu every time that is at least at the end of the activity one should do that end of the day one should do that uh, just to make sure that the ego does not appropriate to itself and say i am the doer because the moment it comes in that's where the problem comes all right we had talked about this uh, this drawing was there last week so let's go a little further then what does it say bahirantascha bhutanam acharam charame vacha sukshmatvat avigneyam durastham cha antike chatat bahir antas bahir means outside anta is inside so look at that balloon that uh, so bubble that the space is outside and inside the film of that so bubble just creates a little boundary even that boundary is doesn't cut that is and separate the two in two parts so is pervading all pervading through that bahirantas chabhutana means in all beings acharam charam eva cha chara means move acharam means not moving and charam means moving so the activity that is happening is happening because of that shakti that power yet as consciousness all pervading consciousness it is not moving on it movement is happening the ocean is not moving but on the surface of the ocean or within the ocean the ocean currents there is movement but as a whole it is not moving that whole is what is called brahman it is incomprehensible due to its subtleness comprehension means we can capture it with the help of our mind and understanding to understand it i can comprehend it but it is so subtle that it is beyond the reach of the mind beyond thoughts so suppose we are looking at something with our naked eye and then somebody says you know on that same table if you look with a magnifying glass or through a microscope you will see some bacteria or something moving there so why don't uh, that bacteria is so subtle here so small that it is beyond the grasp or reach of the physical eye but it can be grasped if the 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 microscope is uh, is used so in meditation in yoga in spiritual life it is about developing that capacity of subtle perception finer than the senses and beyond even the mind that's why it's called supra sensuous experience beyond the the senses the senses are very very gr gross we talked about this of the five senses the tongue and the tail the, the taste and the smell and the the touch but deal with very low energy the next higher one is sound energy and therefore you can hear far away things the slot more information that's gathered through the ear because the energy level is higher and even higher than that is light so you can see far away things and that's the most powerful sense that we have and uh, but they all operate right up to that visual spectrum there are so many other x rays microwaves gamma rays and so many other rays of energy that's all around us all the time that we do not perceive so we have to understand the limitations of the senses and therefore we should not make these senses the yardstick to measure the reality that means we should not say show god to me if you can't show it to him to me i would don't i will not believe it, that he exists uh, it's like somebody says if i can't see that bacteria on the table then it doesn't exist show it to me. so that is of course somebody can put a microscope and show you but that's an external how do you call it uh, equipment uh, out regarding the spiritual reality you have to have develop our own microscope or telescope to see sometimes spiritual teachers 
with their power can lift the mind. And we know that story of Manmathanath Ganguly, how uh, Swami Vivekananda lifted his mind and revealed to him that pure consciousness that was pervading through all names and forms, and he brought his mind down and consciousness appeared and the world reappeared. That is the power of spiritual teachers, the great, who, who can give a glimpse. Others will say, will give you the tools by which you can develop that capacity. What is the tool? This is the technique of meditation and the mantra, and they'll teach you the technique. And as you practice that, the mind becomes subtle and subtle and subtle. And as it becomes subtle, the truth becomes revealed uh, at that particular level. So, sukshmatvat avignayam, because of its intrinsic subtleness, sukshma, sthul means gross, sukshma means subtle. It is a vignayam, it is incomprehensible. And then it goes, it is durastham, durasthitam, durastham, cha antike cha tat. Tat means that, that supreme consciousness. It is far and it is near. It's within you and outside. So you'll see sometimes they will use these two extremes to say that it's beyond even the words. It's smaller than the smallest, greater than the greatest, further uh, at the greatest distance, and yet it is right inside your own heart. It's moving, it's not moving. Basically, they're trying to say, we are trying to exhaust the human language, the two endpoints of it, and say, that might give you some hint about it, but we are admitting that it is beyond the grasp of ideas, mental activity. But it can be experienced, not described, it can be experienced when one's own capacity or mind becomes purified and more subtle, then it is a direct experience. It's called apoksha anubhuti. Anubhuti means experience. Aksha means eyes. Paraksha means somebody else's eyes. Somebody saw something and is reporting to you. Aparo means it is not through somebody else's experience and reporting. In other words, saying it is your own direct experience. It's another way of expressing that it is. it cannot be found in books. It cannot be found in scriptures and teachings. At best, they can give a bit of hint about it. But the reality is inside our own heart. It's very close to us. It's within us. It is behind this activity of the body and the mind and the ego. And therefore, it's nearer to us than anything else. Yet, because our mind is just stuck at this lower plane through working constantly through the senses and through ideas and thinking, it has not developed that subtle capacity to uh, comprehend the, the, the even subtler thing. That's why we are stuck in this particular gross plane. And we are born in there when you come into this world as a baby, we live in that, we grow up and we die in there also. That is the plight of most of the people. But human beings can do better than that. Now, avibhaktam cha bhuteshu vibhaktam iva chasitam bhut bharti tata gnyayam grashishnu prabhu vishnu cha. And that noble, the supreme game, avibhaktam. Vibhaktam means it's divided. Avibhakta, when you put a as a prefix beyond a word, it changes the meaning, like himsa, ahimsa. So avibhakta means it's undivided. And iva, iva means as if. It appears to be divided when it is existing in different individuals, in different beings. So go back to this ocean of consciousness, is avibhaktam. But when the bubbles appear, then it seems to be divided. And we, that, that divided or the personalized, when we call that is my Atman. You say, my Atman is different from your Atman. Everyone has got a different Atman type of thing. Brahman is the universal substratum of which all these Atmans are there. The Brahman is the universal space. And uh, what is contained in the bubble is the is the Atman. So the space is undivided, but it appears to be divided when these bubbles appear, so to say. I think that's pretty easy to understand. Avibhaktam cha bhuteshu, vivaktam iva chastam. Iva means as if, 
it appears to be it really is not divided that's a important idea there okay so bhuta bharati tad chatad jingyam so where is it he is the bharta he is the sustainer sustainer of all living beings so when you are living beings there is some energy that is sustaining the body the food that we eat it provides us that energy basically we consume energy uh, maybe not as smartly as plants do so we need that energy what happened the plant captured the sun's light and in the chlorophyll or chloroplast it converted that into starch and stored it as some potato or dallow something like that and then we are not so we can't go out in the sun and say okay i'll just absorb the sunlight and i'm charged i've charged myself solar we need to eat that food break it into starch and sugars and then burn that in the cell inside the cell and release that energy go through that long process of unlocking the energy and that energy is contained in that food so actually that uh, that energy which is pure consciousness becomes light becomes material thing and then human beings need to eat it and digest it and uh, go through the respiration before they can utilize that energy for the physical activity such a long round way process but if you don't provide that energy somebody is starving then they will die the body will not be able to sustain itself so ultimately that cosmic energy the divine energy of the supreme being is really the sustainer of all life forms on in this universe in this world if there was no sunlight then all the plants will die and all all living beings will also die in this planet we can't maintain the form so bhut bharati is the real sustainer source of energy uh, that sustains uh, uh, all beings so know that to be the sustainer of bhut bharati all living beings and the devara as the and the originator also grasishnu prabha vishnu so all forms appear from where from that ocean of consciousness imagine this three bubbles happening the the ego one full of bliss then the water appears and the ice and then in the reverse process at the time of pralaya emerging it goes resolves back into the course ice melts into water water into water vapor and that is we say uh, when it's creating then it's a brahma is that's a brahma's job i mean it's taking maintaining everything then that is that functional aspect of the divine we call vishnu and when he's reabsorbing everything into itself going back to its original course that is samahara that is rudra uh, uh, the devara but really forms are appearing forms are being sustained forms are resolving into their own course and we are just one of those forms where inside we have got this physical body like the eyes permeating permeating penetrating through all of that is the mind and the physical body disappears the mind still re remains and penetrating the even the mind level and the body level is the third which is the anandamaya kosha in terms of koshas we say there are five koshas annamaya pranamaya manomaya vigyanamaya anandamaya the first two deal with the sthula sharira gross body annamaya made out of food and vital force the next two prana manomaya vigyanamaya that is to do with the subtle body so subtle body means where the mind and knowledge is anchored and the third one is the blissful sheath which is the karan sharira kojal body gross subtle kojal sthula sukshma karan that is a divisions actually there is not a border line that one ends there and another one starts just like but for for the sake of classification so that we can communicate human mind captures and divides and labels and that's how we begin to discuss and talk so what's the Uh, what's the message uh, teaching of this particular shloka that noble brahman your consciousness the undivided appears to be existing as divided in all beings and it is a sustainer of all beings that's the vishnu part of it originator is the brahma part of it devara is the rudra part of it 
but really all these three are the functional um, brahma vishnu maheshwara are the functional aspects of the same supreme cosmic power shakti shristi sthiti vinashanam we say when we chant the mantra during our evening arati shristi sthiti vinashanam shakti bhute sanatani gunashray gunamaye narayani namostute that is the idea explained here also so that is good so i mean mm. um the lokas that you talked about as well they would exist in the mind the um the subtle and the and the yeah. uh, ego level right? intellect the lokas the different lokas they are like you just like you have got the seven colors in the visual spectrum all right mm uh -huh. so imagine this whole prakriti is manifested into seven bandwidths okay 1 2g 3g 4g like that 7g or different colors and each loka represents a bandwidth and the beings that are present there are the ones who have their consciousness level at that particular level so bhur bhuva swaha mahajana tapa brahma loka okay these are the seven uh what you call bandwidths you might say energy levels frequencies planes of existence represented by these chakras that open in the body representing what station different stations of the tv you might say or radio station which one you are tuned to according to that you experience make sense yes yes yeah, yeah. so so we so we do so this yeah you said made a statement saying sustainer of all beings mm. and then if you look at the consciousness it goes down from top to bottom level like a stone or whatever it is right? mm. so when you say sustainer of all beings is this covered there i mean the lowest level i mean it is also there is just the manifestation of power the amount of tamas initially i saw intensive that you hardly see any activity the stone is not moving and talking but it is pervading because it's all pervading you see yeah yeah okay so if if you're talking about a stone or what so uh, how does it become a stone is it because of karm or how how does this a stone move in the next stage in the next stage of life goes up mm, how does the stone move in the next of the life that is i do not know so all these are forms okay forms encapsulate the energies the shaktis when those shaktis are very high then those forms are gods and goddesses in swarga and all those things human beings are in the middle level plants animals that consciousness still there but plant is animals are moving around but the intelligence thinking reasoning all that has become pretty much less it goes down a little bit more you have got your plants and things you might ask so does a plant have a jiva soul that is going under evolution in this and that then the question i would be asked what do you understand by the the idea of the soul here jivatma so paramatma is that ocean of consciousness in between when that ocean of when that is now sort of captured in the bubble that is where the idea of a jivatma comes all right and then you say my jivatma is different from your jivatma type of thing but from the parmatmas perspective it is only one ocean from the waves perspective they say you are different from me and this and that but it can go through that grossification process even more and more and more what is happening is the layers are being added on to it and this layers are hiding that consciousness more and more and more but it is present there so evolution means the layers are becoming finer and finer and finer the body mind complex becomes more and more sattvic and the light that is inside there is manifesting more and more and more the actually the atman is never coming is never going it's not born from the from the highest truth but it appears to be born it appears to die and because that is an appearance 
that is as a result of ignorance. So, when you ask this question, the first thing, uh, the first thing I would ask, are you asking this question from a point of knowledge or point of ignorance? And most of the time you'll find that the question would be asked from, a, because you assume there's a, a soul that is born, that is evolving and changing and this and all those things. That is the initial assumption. And now it has become a plant or stone. It's a soul in there. But from the highest point of view, from, uh, we can, at our level, level, if you really insist on saying the Atman is born, it is living, is dying and this and that, then we can have a conversation. But from the real uh, absolute knowledge point of view, you can't have that conversation because ultimately it is not born, it does not die. So in chapter 2, Bhagavad Gita, Shri Krishna immediately right in, in the beginning say, Ajo Nityam Shaswato Yam Purano. Aja means it is unborn, Nityam, eternal, Purana, the ancient being. Naha Nate Hamnyamane Sare, see? Swamiji, um, uh, to, to, to Satish, question and even I was thinking the same thing a couple of days back and what I'm thinking is that our our gross body is as non-living uh, or, or as gross as the stone is and what we are what we do is just recycle the grossness throughout the world so the stone that is there that gets hit by water and waves and that breaks into particles that same water flows in through numerous places and it goes to the air and we breathe in that and that becomes a part of our body, which was part of a stone, now becomes a part of my gross body. And someday again, this gross body will go and become another stone. So it's just recycling this it's, in that same space sir, and ground. You body, can say in this way, there's an ocean of matter, all right? And hmm. the things that we say, whether it's my body or stone or tree or plant, is just bundles of that matter. All right. And in matter can flow. What's in a vegetable, you eat, it's become a human uh, body. And then, you know, some cells die, it goes out, it becomes some part of something else. You know, somebody dies and a plant, and, you know, takes it up and makes a, a tree. There's a flow of matter. But there are something that collects that matter and is able to maintain a form. All right. Yes. All right. So like when you're seeing a, a whirlwind of dust wind out in a hot day, there is a bundle of energy that's spinning around, but it sucks in some dust and leaves and this and that, and suddenly you see a dust devil, they call it. All right. Mm -hmm. So the energy is there, but it requires some matter to give it some form. All right. A cyclone is that. There's a bundle of spinning energies there, but it takes the moisture, a cloud, and suddenly you've got a cyclone. All right, you see a whirlpool in the water. So this thing, akasha and prana, energy and matter. This is how this whole world is created. And that's another way of looking, uh, and those who are really interested should read uh, Swami Vivekananda's introduction to Raja Yoga, Patanjali Yoga Sutras, where he talks about this, uh, this akasha and prana, matter, and energy and everything is really a uh, uh, manifestation of this a combination of these two and that is flowing right yeah now. And, yeah yeah and, and 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 i i i kind of sort of read that part and i was intrigued with that explanation that swamiji gave there and in he specifically talked about mountains and stones and how how they interact yeah. with each other and just the energy is breaking a mountain into stones and Yes. Okay. And you just think about it, you know, the sunlight that was generated by some nuclear action in, this, in the sun, okay, comes across that space, a plant captures it, it becomes some food article, you capture it and make part of your own body, then it, it is flowing from one bundle to the other. It's like in a river, there's so many whirlpools are there. What is happening? Water flows and comes into a whirlpool, spins for a while, then it changes and goes into another whirlpool. It's just basically flowing through. But that whirlpool gives a set of a form, and then you say, hey, this is my body. All right. So, Swamiji, I mean, just on, you know, that point and this discussion, I just feel that all we are doing in this gross world is just 
keep on reorganizing things, whether we are doing work, whether we are doing a job, whether we are building something, whether we are creating ideas, we're just reorganizing matter or energy into different forms and shapes, whether subtle or gross. Yeah, and, and for a while also. This transaction of this reorganization of matter. Yeah, it's, and it? that also transaction. you can't do it for very long, you know. So, okay, you, you come into this world as a baby and then you start eating food, growing that, and you're trying to grow that. And then at some point, you're trying to just maintain it. And after a certain age, you can't maintain it. You know, more cells are dying than being born. So your hair begins to change, become white and all the wrinkles appear. And at some point, it's not able to sustain itself. And then it collapses and breaks down by, you know, kidney fail or this fail. So basically, this whirlpool of this body that we built up is sucking in energy and matter, is trying to maintain itself. Sometimes some disease might come and wreak havoc and everything falls apart. Otherwise, older gradually I take it and at some point it cannot sustain itself what has happened matter has gone back to its course uh, into something else energy has flown out through us into something else so that is what we are saying is when we die when the physical matter is uh, um, body the physical matter is that makes the body is not there anymore but the the mental subtle whirlpool that is the mind that continues and then again it picks up some matter somewhere and again it materializes in his home or somebody was born and then it goes so this mukti means the whirlpool has now totally subsided you're free from that bundle of that energy that is maintaining that that individuality Okay, think about that, that from morning to evening, we are trying to just try to build this prison house and we want to remain in this prison house and we don't want to break out. The prison house is a physical body and all these different layers. And Mukti means no body. The, the only problem, Swamiji, that I generally have at times is that when I when I think of this, that all we are doing, all we are doing in this world is just transacting. And so what's doing, the problem with that? Taking that's that's the problem that that we are just transacting and we are making a big issue out of that. And at this at that time I feel that what's what's the real you know reason for making a big issue out of this thing. No reason. And I guess yeah. the moment of, you have really stopped that, it when you have realized that deeply that the futility of this whole thing, everyone comes and tries to build up something, starting with their own body. If one is not good enough, then you want to replicate clone. So you got your children and kids and all those things there, family and this and that, house, everything you build, put so much time and effort in building, but right in front of you, you see they begin to fall apart and our own bodies and everyone knows. But that spiritual intelligence by which we have that grasp of, of the futility of this whole thing again and again we are the, unless that comes we will continue to make that effort and if this but, but sinks in very deeply interested hmm? we keep on getting disinterested about the world then you know and that's where we start disengaging with yeah with so the what's world. the problem that is good so, yeah, yeah. So what what I'm trying to say is that I feel less interested to get into. So when we talk about karma yoga, when we talk about these things, so it you know you work with full efficiency. But when I keep on thinking that all we are doing is just few time, and that's when the interest is. Yeah, lost but you have to understand that intellectual understanding that is there doesn't immediately give you that gives you a little bit of disinterestedness. But remember, all this vrittis that were collected, the samskaras that are still lying down there. So therefore, you have to really engage in, in dissolving those samskaras, overpowering them. That's why the sadhana part is to be done. Okay. The eyes has to melt into water. You have to do some tapasya. Generate that heat just by saying this body, eyes is no good, eyes useless, but it's still remaining there. So long it's there, you are still caught by it. 
but at least you are not building it more. That's the important thing. Pravritti means I'm, I think this is the reality. I'm the reality. Let me preserve this body, eat, exercise, feed, have medicine, this and that, because this is me. At least with this knowledge, you say, this is only for a while. We'll go in sooner or later. Let's not make a big deal about it. There is something more important to realize a subtle entity that's inside me. Let me put my time and effort in that direction. And that understanding takes so much stress and anxiety of outer life. And it, you will know that you are doing the right, the higher thing, the better thing. Okay, so each one has to digest this in knowledge in their own way and then have to apply it uh, from where we are. It But has to be practiced. Just thinking like that is good. You lose some interest in this world. Uh, it's not, but the direct that attention to something that is the reality behind it. That is something important to be done. So what is that? Jyoti Shamapita Jyoti Tamasa Paramuchate. Jyoti means... Jyoti is there. Jyoti is the light, but not the light, sunlight or the light of a candle. As a good example, analogy, it's the light of consciousness. Jyoti Sham Api Tad Jyoti. So it means it is the light even of the lights. Okay. That means with the physical light, we can see something is happening around us. If the light is not there, then we are in darkness. Uh, eyes don't see. But when you go to sleep, in your dream, you see things. This, so what is the light by which we see things in our dream? Okay, so there we say, hey, that is the light of the mind. Mind is thinking in a very gentle way. Ideas are popping up, uh, maybe things you remembered in this and that in an uncontrolled way. So those, uh, that is what your dream experience is there. But what is that, that, that light that makes me aware of myself, that emness in me? Oh, then you say that must be some spiritual consciousness. So basically in that way, we go, that consciousness that we feel within ourselves as a conscious being, you are X, Y, and Z, we all are. That consciousness has got that supreme consciousness behind it. That means the water in the wave is there, we are feeling it there. And its presence that behind the form of the wave, all the waves contain water. But the water actually comes out of the ocean. Okay. And if all the waves subside, the water still remains there. It's indestructible. But it can take the forms, which is the wave, the bundle, the whirlpool, or it can be waveless, formless. Why does it take the form? Well, if you ask the ocean, why do you become so many waves? He says, you know, that's how I am. I like it. You know, sometimes I'm in waves. Sometimes I'm without. Sometimes I'm creating out of myself. All these beings come and sometimes I resolve. And this is how I choose to be. The wave doesn't really have much say in that. Jyoti Sham Apita Jyoti Tamasa Param Uchate. Tamasa means darkness. Darkness or ignorance. Param means beyond. Uchate, it is spoken of. It is said to be beyond all ignorance. Like on the moon, one side is lit, on the other side is dark. That's the nature because the light doesn't belong to it. So in the human body, in the individual, there is knowledge and there is ignorance, light and darkness, because that light is not its own. But on the sun, it is in all directions. It's self-effulgent. Therefore, that Atman or Brahman is called self-effulgent, but it illumines other things. It shows there's a moon. If there was no sunlight, would you see the moon? No. It reflects the light. It bounces back to the moon and the sun. And the sun says there's a beautiful moon. But it doesn't maybe realize in ignorance that it is own light bouncing back to it. Moon is only the reflector. It is just showing its own glory. So likewise, all that beauty and knowledge that we experience in our life, whether it's sense experience, happiness, this and that, they don't really come from the things that we think are beautiful or source of knowledge. 
for that matter. They are the nature of the Atman. These are different reflectors. And in ignorance, we mistake the source. And that's why we run more after them. Thinking, this will make me happy, that will make me happy. Really, they all reveal to us only in different measure the glory of the Atman that we are. And we make so many attempts. Ultimately, we realize at some point, none of them would be able to fully reflect the infinite glory of the being that I am, that all attempts are in vain, fruitless. And at that point, it makes a U-turn. It says, I don't have to go out there. I am the self-reflecting being. Why should I look at my reflection in the mirror? It only distorts me in some way. That type of return path is, is, where, is the spiritual journey, nir, nivritti. So, Jyoti Shamapita Jyoti Tamasavara Muchate Jnanam Gyam Jnana Gamyam Hridi Sarvasya Vishthitam Jnanam Gyam Jnana Gamyam Jnanam means knowledge that was talked about in uh, Amanitya Madam Bhitto Mahimsa Santir Arjavam from verse 5. Gyam is a noble that which is to be known and and, and Jnana Gamyam the known which is vishtitam, our sthitam, existing in the hearts of all beings. Heart means not the physical heart, not in that heart level. It means the center of the foundation. Hrit ayam, the word hridayam comes from Sanskrit. Hrit ayam. Ayam means this. Hrit means center. So when we say, this is the center of my being where I feel I really exist. And people will force it, point it to the heart as an emotional center. But it means, Hridayam um, means, uh, when you say from the bottom of my heart, from the depth of my being, from my real essence, I'm saying this type of expression is there. And that center is, is that spiritual foundation on which all these three levels, these bodies are, having their play and to be anchored in that sun center is called swastha being established in that awareness that i am the spiritual being so when somebody comes and asks you aapka swastha kaisa hai it doesn't mean he's asking how healthy is your body is it he is really asking a spiritual question are you established in your spiritual foundation that is the deeper meaning of question. And we have discussed that in our series of podcasts on well-being, starting what is real well-being. It is to be established in the knowledge or the experience of our spiritual foundation on which all this body-mind complex and everything is happening. So that is present in all beings. And that's the source of all that we need, all knowledge, all beauty, purity, goodness, peace, freedom, whatever you want, it is there right now in every one of us. In ignorance, we have mistaken the body to be our reality. That is my identity or the mind. That is my identity. So make a big fuss about it. You know, I'm black, brown, white. I'm male, I'm female or others in the whole spectrum. They are there nowadays. Or this is my profession or that profession. Uh, that is how the mind has been programmed by our education and university. We call ourselves engineer, doctor, teacher. We're basically talking about the conditioning of the mind. Or even this ego is there. I, I, I is there. All of them are really so many coverings. And the thicker the covering, the more we are bound. The thinner the covering, the more the inner light manifests. Let us focus attention on that original source of consciousness on which everything has been established, by which everything happens, and into which everything will return. So that is our true reality. If we reinforce that idea of our real identity, our spiritual identity as that foundation, that is the starting, the real, uh, what you call, goal of spiritual experience that we want. But at least the mind is now asserting the truth. When you tell, I'm a living, I'm a spiritual being, having a human experience. This experience is transitory, temporary, it'll come, it'll go. But my reality is a spiritual entity that is telling the truth to ourselves. 
But every time we say I'm X, Y, and Z as described in our biodata and CV and this and that, and make a big deal about it and, and beat our drum around in this world, create more confusion around everywhere, then we are established in ignorance. And ignorance always brings misery. So that's the way to overcome all misery, bring in the light of knowledge of the Atman and everything is then seen in the proper perspective. Then in chapter Sutra 18, he says, Iti, thus, Shetram, has been spoken, Shetram, the field, right in the beginning, Tatha Gyanam, that was the second state, and now he has talked about the game, Cha Uktam Samasata. Samasata means in brief, he has explained. So he has now, Sri Krishna has talked about the field and the number of the field, which is just now, Chetragna or Gyam, and the knowledge. Jnanam, Gyam, Jnanagam. This has been described so far in 17 verses uh, uh, briefly. And then he says something else. He says, Madhbhakta etad vignaya madhbhavaya upapadhyate. My devotee, Madhbhakta, etad this, Vignaya, by understanding this, here means by realizing this, Upapadhyate becomes qualified for my state, Madhbhava. That means one has experienced, uh, has really sorted this out, not say, through some philosophical and ex intellectual understanding only, that's a starting point, point of it, but as an experience, becomes qualified for my state. What is that my state? That is the supreme being. Tad Vishnu Paramam Padam. The supreme being. Which is the Brahman. And then you can watch the movie. Watch the show. But not get deluded by uh, what's happening around in the, on, in the movie screen. That means on the white screen, very movies can be shown. There can be tragedies and there can be comedies. They're just only a play of light and shadow. Uh, in the movie, there can be some bloodshed, some shooting, but when the movie is over, the screen is untouched, untainted, and that is the beauty and the glory of the Atman, birth and death, coming and going, happiness and misery, all the suffering and whatever experiences you have, they cannot and do not touch the Atman. In fact, we are as the Atman, O Brahman, the untouchable one. The world cannot touch us, death cannot touch us, disease cannot touch us, misery cannot touch us. Even to think about that wonderful state frees the mind, even if temporarily, this is the glory of my Supreme Self. Uh, and that is the same reality behind everyone else. So, we'll take up these other verses, the Prakriti and Purusha and all those things. Do read uh, a couple of, of the uh, slokas and try to understand in your own ways. That will take us to the third or the fourth subsection of this uh, chapter. But now you can see we are forming that garland where different flowers are being stitched together. And there's a continuity. And let us see how it leads us to the actual practice and uh, what is to be done and how what is the nature of that realization. Uh, all those ideas become a bit more clearer. That makes you get up early in the morning, five o'clock, to seriously do your sadhana. If it is not doing something like that, that means uh, that ideas have not been assimilated. It is there, very nice, but I'm not so interested about my Atman in, in, in realizing it. I'm busy with eight hours of work. I don't have time for five minutes of meditation. That type of excuse will come. But if you really grasp this, then this these ideas will make you act on them. You can't ignore them and leave them and say, oh, it's nice to know the Atman is there. I am immortal, never born, never dying. But I'll carry on in this body and do my things that I'm doing every day. Life goes on. That type of, if, uh, that type of <laughs> continuity is there. That means we've eaten the food, but we have not digested it and we have not assimilated it yet. All right, let us end here today and offer it to the Supreme Being by whose grace we have all gathered here and have had this discussion of the spiritual knowledge. It's called Gyani Yajna. Let us offer it to him. Om Satoma Sadgamaya.
तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमया मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमया ओं शांति 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 हरिओं तत्सत्म कृष्णापनमस्तू